Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is Extending Asset Life in a Changing Market. My name is Audrey Leon. I'm the editor of Offshore Engineer Magazine. Joining me today uh, from Lloyd's Register, we have Neil Morgan, the lead geotechnical specialist, and we have Stuart Hamilton, a corrosion engineer. Both of you welcome, and uh, please uh, start when you are ready. OK, thank you. Um, so my name is Neil Morgan, uh, and I'm just going to give a brief introduction before I make my presentation. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the, the sort of um, extending asset life in a changing market and some of the challenges uh, and how it can be done safely and cost effectively. Um, so Stuart and I work in Lloyd's Register, which is uh, a fairly big company, and we're in the energy sector. Um, so we're really involved in the, the sort of uh, the day-to-day -day experience of asset, asset integrity management and asset life extension, um, and we see a lot of experience each year. Um, so there's me on the left there and Stuart on the right. My presentation is going to come first, uh, and uh, it's going to look at the the sort of structural aspects of asset life extension, and in particular the challenges that go along with that, um, focusing on some of the main issues that we see uh, regularly occurring in the industry. Uh, and those looking through it, we're going to look at the um, the kind of challenges that platforms have working within standards, conservatism in offshore engineering, and then trying to bring innovation and research into industry practice. So. If we look at the, the typical life of a platform, the, uh, you can see there on the screen I've given a schematic, uh, and a, a code compliant platform was constructed in, say, 1985, and at that time it fully met the standards uh, and everything was okay. And if you move on through to 1995, as an example here, uh, a vessel impacted the leg and caused damage. And then if you move on to 2005, they maybe discovered a, a subsea development nearby and they tied it into an existing platform rather than building a new one. So the, basically, I think the aim of this slide is to sort of discuss the fact that the condition of a structure changes during its life for almost any number of reasons. Uh, and, and then we move on to 2015 there where the, the platform needs a 10-year life extension. But at that point, they, they then discovered that maybe the there is a, a 10,000 year wave in deck issue. Um, it might have more or less weight than when the platform was originally constructed. For example, a, a drilling derrick may have been removed or you may have had more live loading. Um, and at that point, it's the kind of structural integrity is varying throughout its life as a result of all these possible changes. Uh, and then move on through to 2025 where the asset was decommissioned. And generally speaking, a life extension needs to manage all of these challenges, some of which may have been outstanding for many years, and we'll discuss those further. So as per the slide before, um, many offshore structures, when they were installed, they met the original standard requirements, but they may have become non-standard for a variety of reasons. And a few of those are listed there, such as soil damage since installation, change in met ocean loading or a, a seismic hazard was recognized, for example, on the northwest shelf of Australia, or, or just simply they used unconventional designs from what would be considered today. So really, a, a standard is a, a good starting point for a, a standard situation, but it, it doesn't necessarily cover all of these extra things that need to be taken into account. Uh, and I guess the other point there is that a life extension is often a, a redesign of an existing design and even though that is the case and it's difficult to modify, it, it generally needs, needs to meet today's standards in order to be satisfactory. And one of the, the key things with working within a standard is to try and distinguish between what's a normative requirement, uh, and normative means that you must do something or you shall do it, or, and an informative guidance within the standard. And that's more things that you may do or you might use. So uh, a simple example there is to say that a normative requirement is you must calculate pile capacity and a pile factor of safety. And the, the informative guidance there is that the standard might present methods that you can use if they're appropriate. 
So really it's, it's important when you're using a standard to distinguish between those two things. Um, on the other hand, when you're using a standard, as engineers we have a responsibility to make sure that our designs are robust, so they're, they're safe, functional, fit for purpose, but also pragmatic. It is difficult to change an existing structure. Uh, you might have cost or constructability. And one of the things that we often see is that the earlier these informative issues are raised, so that the, the standard says something, but it's more something that you may be able to do, um, the, the sooner those issues are recognized, the better it usually is for a project uh, and to take appropriate steps. So to move on to an example, there's a, a, a new build platform probably um, quite some time ago. It built west of Shetland, but the, the soil conditions were really unusual, basically. It had extremely hard clays, dense sands, um, very complex seabed conditions, but also relatively deep water. So on the one hand, you had high loading, and on the other hand, it was quite difficult to actually install foundations. Um, and this complexity basically caused some concern of whether the typical methods that are used daily in industry, the informative methods in the standard, were appropriate or whether something else would have been better, and also installation was a concern. So the, the operator luckily recognized this um, sort of informative issue and, and developed an independent assurance team to try and find a robust way to work within the standard, you know, meet the requirement that power capacity and power factor of safety must be satisfactory, but on the other hand, not necessarily to use the informative methods presented there. So they involved people like the contractors, um, consultants, academics, and certifiers to, to sort of um, form a good industry view of how the problem should be solved. Um, and I guess that prevented them from them finding a, a sort of issue, a surprise later in the project, which often causes cost overruns or other major problems. So then moving on to the next topic, uh, and it's quite frequently uh, a word, the word failure is mentioned during a life extension, and it's prediction using analysis that, that the platform might fail. And often that could be a combination of things, um, perhaps one thing on top of another, like a, a 10,000 year wave or a seismic hazard risk, or simply that the weight's gone up, or that you may or may not have drilling equipment on any longer, or it could be easily removed. Uh, and also that inspections may have been performed, but they haven't actually managed to determine the, the condition of certain things accurately. And, and what this um, sort of leads you to do is that in analysis, engineers tend to have a um, sort of a need for conservatism, so they might end up putting conservatism on each of these individual elements. Uh, and what that could do is actually really make things quite bad. And, you know, the picture on the right-hand side there is says, well, if you're too conservative with every element of your structural analysis, you might end up needing to demand the platform during uh, a sort of predicted bad weather. And that demanding then has an additional risk that you need to do helicopter transfers in bad weather. So you're trying to solve one or reduce risk by introducing conservatism, but you actually reintroduce another risk somewhere else, which, which kind of might offset what you're attempting to do in the first place. So the nuclear, UK nuclear industry recognized this as a problem, uh, and you can see on the right-hand side there that they published a document uh, looking at appropriate conservatism in safety cases for nuclear installations. And what they're really sort of saying was that it's quite easy to be conservative, but it's probably going to cost. Uh, and it could be things like excessive production costs, um, another facility or indeed platform in the offshore industry with less conservatism in the analysis was deemed okay, or people might not believe your answer. So really what they're sort of saying is that they think it's better that you have overall conservatism in a design rather than trying to be conservative in every single element of it. Um, and, and the guide contains quite a lot more guidance on um, how to manage conservatism or under conservatism within offshore developments. So I guess in conclusion there, conservatism could be seen as a, a false friend or indeed even the, the enemy of safety. And it's something that needs to be managed quite well. 
So now we're going to move on to a, an audience poll question. Um, and the question is, which of the following difficulties have you experienced in getting new technical innovations or new design methods included into a project? And the options are, you can select one or zero or all three options. The options are client or stakeholder acceptance, perceived risk to a project, e.g. schedule or cost, or uncertainty of technical success. So please select um, any of the three options on the poll. Okay, I think we can move on and see the, the results of the poll. So we can see there that quite a lot of people, um, probably I guess about 30% have um, suggested that client or stakeholder acceptance has provided an obstacle, sorry, 40% um, suggested that client or stakeholder acceptance was a problem. Uh, again, a similar number said it was a problem because of perceived risk to a project. And then uh, a slightly smaller number talked about uncertainty of technical success. So actually, I think this, this kind of reflects um, probably the slides that are following is that it can be quite difficult to get new technical innovation or, or methodology included. Um, but on the other hand, we need to look at the benefits of doing that and how we can do that. Okay, so let's move on. So really, um, the, the benefit of innovation or research to aging assets or asset life extension can be huge. But really, the, I think there's a recognized sort of issue that the industry can be slow to adopt for a number of different reasons. And I think what we, what I sometimes think is that it's a, a kind of parallel situation to the industry in the 60s, 70s, and perhaps even 80s, where methods that we routinely use today were not that well understood then, but somehow the industry managed to go through this learning process and become much more confident than they were at the start. So the next few slides are going to look at some examples of research, research and development and then their impact on asset life extension. first example we'll look at is pile aging. And this is basically where pile capacity goes up um, as piles age, you know, sort of um, five years after installation or 10 years after installation. It's quite common to see that pile capacity could have gone up by 100%. But this benefit is seldom counted in, in industry practice, even though really over the past 20 years it's been quite widely recognized uh, and sort of um, agreed on. And there in the top right, you can see some pile tests going on from, from NGI uh, looking at this effect. And I think although it's well recognized, the question is why, how can we not quite do this um, in, in routine practice? And perhaps it's just the cautiousness around new technology and, and not understanding um, completely how it can be done. But on the other hand, if we could get a, even a fairly modest increase, say 10% or 20%, it could make quite a lot of difference to a, a lot of platforms that are nearing the end of their uh, intended service life. Um, and then the, the example underneath there, sorry, come back. The example underneath there is to look at um, another common issue is that 10,000 year wave heights are, are now a recognized issue that needs to be accounted for in life extensions and the wave heights have been estimated to increase. And obviously this has then resulted in a reduced air gap for quite a few platforms, not all, but quite a number, and that can cause wave and deck loading. So another way there to try and reduce conservatism in design or, or to make a more accurate assessment of the loads is to try and do um, research on those. And, and for example, there the, the 
Global Technology Center in Singapore from Lloyd's has been looking at the use of uh, CFD to calibrate simple analytical tools to make more rapid assessment of those loads uh, and obviously then to give the benefit that we're not being too conservative in the assessment. Another topic that's um, frequently come up in asset life extensions for us is that of um, structure and, uh, and in particular pile fatigue. So in, for example, in the, the North Sea in the 70s and 80s, it was quite common to put very long piles in, even though the ground conditions were quite good and a larger diameter would have been better. It, it was pretty common to put sort of very, very long piles in. And although they actually got them installed, they required very high blow counts to get them there. And one of the things that we're now seeing is that when pile fatigue is assessed during a life extension, the, the fatigue life of the pile theoretically ran out years or even decades ago. So theoretically, the pile should have failed. But in reality, we've never, I don't know of any pile fatigue failures. So it kind of says, well, the methods we're using aren't really um, making accurate predictions. So another JRP research at the Welding Institute has looked at characterizing material from decommissioned structures to try and gain a, a much better sort of picture of the, the actual material that's been subject to the fatigue damage in order to try and make better assessments. And I guess uh, many of the problems um, are quite well recognized uh, and Lloyd has a, a technology qualification scheme that actually provides a, a kind of methodology and a, a systematic process to allow the, the use of new technology or new design methods within uh, a project. And what this is aimed at doing is providing a, a rational process to do that such that all the stakeholders and, and clients and industry are satisfied that the, the risks with that technology have been identified that, and they can be managed and really that it can achieve its goals. So I think although there's some reluctance from the industry there to include it, there are sort of um, processes that, that can be used to try and achieve it safely. Okay, so to sum up my presentation, it, it's looked at structural asset life extension um, and really it, the main thing is probably to try and identify issues early and work with them early uh, to avoid them becoming unpleasant surprises later. So along those themes, we've looked at normative versus informative guidance within the standards, achieving an overall balance of conservatism rather than having too much conservatism in each element of the design, and perhaps even tracking those conservatisms and unconservatisms through a project to make sure that you understand where they are and, and how they can be used. Uh, and then finally looking at the use of research and development and incorporating it into actual project or, or industry practice, uh, perhaps using a, a formal process like technology qualification. And I'll now hand on to my colleague Stuart for the next part of the presentation. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm Stuart Armden, a corrosion engineer, as introduced at the start of the presentation. Uh, I work within uh, asset integrity, so we're really looking at the, the pressure systems, uh, static equipment usually, and, and pipelines, uh, as well as other uh, components associated with those systems. So our asset life extension is obviously if we are looking at the continued operation of a component beyond its regular design life. Now that could mean different things to different components. So if you had a good, strong, well-designed corrosion-resistant alloy, for example, it may maintain its original level of, of thickness and, and integrity throughout its whole life and beyond. However, if you have something that is expected to degrade and age over time, um, its performance may dip over time uh, to the point where at some point it will become unacceptable and you won't be able to use it or you'll have to do some, some repairs modifications. So hopefully, when you're in your asset and life extension phase, uh, you're still able to use it because it's been well maintained throughout its original design life, uh, and you can do that without much maintenance. However, other activities where or components which haven't been designed adequately or have been perhaps not operated as well as they could have and not as well maintained, you may actually lose integrity and, and have failures at the end of the design life or, or even before. Uh, causing considerable 
uh, expense to your project and operations. So that's the life extension from the integrity point of view, we're really looking at ageing. And that's not how old something is in terms of number of years, but how it's degrading and how that uh, fits into the overall life that's required of the component. So we're really looking at degradation mechanisms such as corrosion and fatigue, where things will get worse over time and it will potentially lose uh, its structural integrity at the end of the day. So for asset life extension, we're really looking to describe and better understand the actual age of the component and where it might actually sit on, on, on the bathtub curve here. So obviously, traditional uh, bathtub curve, you'll have lots of failures at the start of the, the life when the design issues and construction fabrication are all realized. And then towards the end of life and beyond, you expect a lot of rapid uh, failures as well. So Part of the life extension process is to define how likely these things are to happen and, and where they actually exist. So the goals of life, life extension, um, asset life extension is normally initiated through a desktop study where we'll look at the, the overall design of this component and the system, uh, define what the integrity, integrity operating windows would be for that system, so how should it be operated We'll then compare that to um, how it has been operated, the maintenance and inspection history to allow us to perform further studies and assessments to determine uh, how the component is operated, should be operated, and could be operated in the future. So we do this to, to help us to improve four key components. One, availability of the item. So can we use it? Are there any limitations on its use? Has it been derated in the past? Do we require to, to remove that to fulfill our asset life extension and, and achieve the uptime that we're actually looking for in the asset? In addition to that, we're looking at accessibility. Um, do we get to inspect and maintain the equipment when it's required? Or do we have to look at other uh, more innovative approaches, such as perhaps non-intrusive inspection, to get the same information. Again, we can perhaps only do that if we've been, uh, if we've got good confidence in the condition uh, through inspection and other activities. Also, looking at reliability. So, has it failed in the past? Have similar components failed in the past? And can we relate that to future performance? Or if it hasn't failed, can we be certain that it won't fail? And then we can limit inspection and maintenance going forward as well to help reduce costs and, and push the asset into life extension. And durability would be the assessment of remaining life for a given component. So if we can look at how it has been operated, predict corrosion rates, and perhaps put measures and barriers in place to try and extend the remaining life of the system, then that will hopefully give us uh, a good operating asset uh, to take forward. So how do we go about achieving these goals? You would want to initially determine the current condition. So what do we actually know about it? And how far removed is that from design or, or predicted uh, theoretical condition that we might have inspected? Also to, to help us to reduce cost and become more sort of, maintain uptime and improve uptime, we can also look at different ways to, to handle the strategies. Can we now focus on safety critical elements alone, whereas we, were, we had some production driven uh, items before that we had to maintain? Can we look at non-intrusive inspection over intrusive uh, to try and gain the same information without disrupting the plant? And are there any fabric maintenance repair activities that would be planned uh, to maintain the component in a in an as new condition, which you might want at the start of the life that you perhaps don't need to do anymore. Can, can we stop recoating the internal surfaces of a, a vessel we only need for three more years, for example? You may want to reevaluate the consequences within our risk assessments. Uh, an asset which is, or the consequence of a failure on a new asset which is 95% oil is very different to the safety consequence of something which now is 95% water. We have lower gas contents in there as well. Um, an actual the dollar value um, to the company may be a lot lower from, for any failures in terms of production losses as well. 
Uh, now that we've got a large amount of information, we should be able to predict uh, future degradation with some confidence, and it would allow us to perhaps extend some inspection frequencies and bring in others and, and really focus uh, our efforts properly. Are there any parts of the system where we would like to streamline it? Did we originally have three trains because we were producing many megascuffs of uh, gas and, and now we're at 10% of that value, so can we now go down to two trains, one full-time, one standby, and how can that help us to maintain and, and in, uh, improve our inspection plans going forward to maintain the uptime? And also looking at planned maintenance activities, um, have you been carrying them out properly? Have you not? Does that actually have impact on the number of times that, that things fail, such as rotating equipment and valves? And how can we weigh up the, the safety implications of that against the, the cost and the reliability issues that are there? So this should all fall part of your, your asset life extension study. I'll take an opportunity to stop and ask a poll question uh, for the audience again. In this case, uh, which of the following is considered the greatest challenge to managing asset life extension, particularly for uh, pressure systems? Is it the clarity of strategy changes that are uh, taking the asset from normal operation to late life? What's changed? Um, how should it be changed? And how should we be treating it? Or the ability to determine actual condition, because we've got poor history, no one's been gathering the information that we actually require to uh, keep these studies or make the studies, or is it the actual ability to define the life extension period and operational requirements? So what do, do we actually have to achieve to uh, get this life extension? So I'll just take a minute. Okay, um, I think we've, we've had quite a good response there. As you can see, um, the large proportion, which would have been my suspicion, 65% uh, say it's the, the lack of history. So if any message I could get out to, to anybody is to get the data as early as you can in its life, and this will allow you to, to have accurate assessments and to help maintain and, and push things forward later in life. So. as was expected to some extent. So <clears throat> how is asset life extension any different to integrity management? Um, if you look at the, the KP4 guidance from the UK uh, HSE, a lot of the description and the things you're asked to do is very, very similar to integrity management as it should be conducted anyway. Um, so the actual process doesn't change, but hopefully um, the amount of data that you have and the conclusions and assessments that you can perform should hopefully uh, improve a bit. We went back and we re revisited the bathtub. Um, we're now expecting lots and lots of failures because actually the design life has been exceeded. So we have a lot of assets out there, in, uh, particularly in the North Sea, which are way, way beyond the original design life. Some have lots of failures and some not so many. So obviously we want to go back and assess where each of our components or our system as a whole actually sits within that bathtub. Um, and through good assessment and good information, we can actually determine remaining lives with a greater confidence. And that can help uh, put out what um, repairs and, and remedial actions are actually required or, or barriers to, to help uh, achieve the, the life. We also should, when we're in the life extension, have a, a clearer picture of where the finishing line is, so we've got greater understanding of the field life and uh, the things that senior management uh, a bit of love, uh, would like to see uh, to achieve that, so we've got greater uh, improvement in, in uptime is required to, to actually break even, and we want to try and decrease the operational costs, and we can do that through better uh, 
implementation of our, our operational uh, plan maintenance activities with a view looking at historically how well the system has operated. Again, we may actually have added redundancy in the system, which allows us to plan activities better to bring down certain trains to without bringing down the whole system altogether or the whole asset. Um, software and data management, this is a key part of asset life extension. There's a theme throughout the, the presentation. So we've got certain systems that are sitting there doing lots of good work and perhaps are not analysed to the best degree. So your work management system, SAP Maximal, um, religiously updated, I would say, by certain people, but perhaps not interrogated by the right people um, in some cases. So have a good idea of, of your plan attainment rate from that. Um, are repairs being carried out? Uh, are they being carried out when required? Uh, how good a job has been done? And we could also trend reliability. Do things break down as you were expecting or, or less often? So we start pushing things out and, and looking more critically at it. Obviously, the integrity management database, uh, LR's versions of RBMI and AXM, would allow you to track your inspection history against your operational history. So how is it degraded in early life, midlife, and late life? Is it look quite constant? Is it speeding up or is it slowing down? So you can come into all of these assessments and hopefully that information is there. You also look at the maintenance, again, for the product from LR, uh, Artemo software which actually looks at analysing ARIDA data and your own um, reliability data from your work management system to try and look at the plan maintenance schedules. Do you have to do it every month or can we actually stretch that three, six months? And there's a obvious impl implication with safety and also profitability or production for the system that needs to be weighed up to help you make these decisions. And that can be applied quite readily to uh, rotating equipment and your non-standard uh, integrity uh, concerns, you know, valves and will they open and close and, and things like that. So a couple of case studies I'd like to run through of recent uh, asset life extension projects. So one example is a, an FPSO which had a 20 year design life and they're looking to extend that by another 10 or 11 years. Um, they hadn't really considered um, integrity management as a process. It was more uh, regulatory um, compliance and uh, time-based approach within the system. So to help benefit or conduct the asset life extension, we had to show a process to manage the aging of the assets, to establish the actual condition of the systems, the critical systems within there and to establish future maintenance. So how are they going to achieve the, the 2032 um, field life that they're, they're hoping for? And in some uh, cases, we had to identify systems that actually need a significant replacement or major overhaul. Asset life extension projects should involve a wide variety of disciplines, as this one did, from structural engineers, pipelines, uh, integrity engineers, fire and safety, electrotech, uh, and others. So some sample conclusions that were drawn more than the integrity management uh, frame of things. But we, we didn't see any clear evidence or link uh, between the plan maintenance within the SAP and the performance standards. So we're doing a lot of things and a lot of activities, but it wasn't really um, linked to performance standards. So there, there was no judgment there uh, or, or no, no benefit in some cases. We didn't have a specific strategy for managing, uh, managing aging equipment, so at some point you have to move away from time base to extend and reduce um, inspections to, to get the best out of it and to reduce the number of failures that are going there. Again, issues were identified and they found some problems and they went off and fixed it, but this wasn't a, a strong uh, normally management process as you would normally expect um, so you lose the, the granularity and the ability to look back at reliability issues and, and where things were actually done.
I had some assistance were operating beyond their design life, and actually we had to, in some cases, point out that remedial action was going to be required, and that allowed them to factor that into um, the cost projections, etc., to, to justify and, and get a clear picture of, of what is required for, for the life extension of the asset. So examples of a few recommendations. Uh, in terms of the process and the way that they worked, they didn't have a, a clear definition of, of the risks associated with the asset, and they certainly weren't um, up to date in some cases. We needed to update the structural integrity management system to take account of the repairs and the new installations that they put on and the, the modifications that they had made throughout its life. They develop a, a damage deterioration risk management program, so to fully understand all the risks and allow them to action and to inspect adequately and properly. In some cases, as I said, the repairs and replacements that were required. Uh, there was a, a lower bearing, which um, had a life, a wear life of 25 years. This was reconfirmed. It was inaccessible for inspection to, to confirm it uh, physically. So. Uh, the only option really is to replace it. In some cases, a time-based inspection maintenance plan had to be maintained because there was a lack of history for the asset. So we had to make sure uh, that that information was gathered before we can actually move to risk-based approach and start moving things out. In terms of assessments, we performed a detailed FEM analysis um, to look at structural fatigue. And this would allow you to have a, or for the client to have a much more focused inspection program. So rather than just going down and inspecting a selection of nodes and, and structural members, they were able to then focus on the hotspots within it. There were some systems which we managed to find out that had recurring or components that had recurring faults within the system. So this obviously identified that there were aging issues already occurring only 10 years in to its life, so we had to look at where the material was actually adequate. Um, and again, there were gaps in, in information, so some inspection, uh, we couldn't make a, a, an informed uh, life extension decision, we had to identify some additional inspection, which again was carried out to allow, allow these to take forward. So for the second life extension study, so it was a dry gas pipeline um, within the, the UK, uh, between the UK and Europe. Uh, the working life of about 40 years, and they're looking to extend that uh, further. Um, so to perform this life extension study, but to review all design and operating inspection data that we gathered, they had gathered historically and looked at the future operational requirements. When is it going to be available for certain activities? What has to be done? Also looking to identify the remaining life of the pipeline uh, and also future maintenance inspection activities that have to be carried out to achieve our, our life extension. We up with a, a review uh, process, so in a structured manner, we had to review design operating uh, data, uh, define corrosion risk assessments of what are the threats, what are we actually looking for, have they been inspected, um, or has inspection been carried out to identify these threats, and have they been quantified, then calculate the remaining life of the system, so internal and external corrosion uh, and other um, mechanisms. And then to define an inspection plan going forward, which if followed would give a, a good uh, good chance that, that the life can be extended beyond. So the conclusion was that from everything we looked at, the remaining life of the, the pipeline itself was in excess of 100 years. That doesn't mean that you can necessarily operate it within 100 years, but based on current degradation and what's expected, and with the adequate in inspection and maintenance, then perhaps it is achievable. So obviously going with that, there was no major, uh, major issues identified and we developed a full inspection and maintenance project uh, plan to, to try and achieve that.
So, in summary, um, to perform asset life extension, a good study with confidence, we need a high level of knowledge and information about the current condition of the safety critical elements to allow us to make any informed decision. Asset life extension management will require continuing assessment of the safety critical elements to ensure they're fit for purpose. So it's not a one-off study. You can walk away. You need to continually look at it. It should be a cyclical event, much like integrity management as itself. An optimization of inspection maintenance can help boost profitability and availability of the units to hopefully um, justify the asset life extension. Yeah. Assessment of accessibility can help you to develop the, the plans and put the plans in place. So once we've got enough information, can we now move to a non-intrusive inspection technique? Can we take advantage of train outages to do inspection rather than uh, causing major shutdowns to the asset? And can we do that with confidence? Lastly, major asset is not considered a reliable indicator of the condition or likelihood of failure. It's based on how that has been operated and how it's actually uh, deteriorating. So we need to really understand how it's been operated and how it's degrading to allow us to, to project into the future to, to justify the life extension. So that's it from me. Um, we will offer some questions. Uh, or start the Q&A section. Oh, well, thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, I know uh, it's definitely been very insightful. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, attendees if you have any questions for them, uh, please submit them at this time. Um, I was wondering uh, if uh, Neil and Stuart, you guys would talk a little bit about, um, you know, you'd mentioned some of the challenges related to asset life extension is not having uh, either the historical data or maybe the reliable data. Uh, maybe, maybe if you could talk a little bit more about um, uh, how to deal with those that lack of information. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Um, yes, I was wondering, because uh, you did touch on this in your presentation um, about some of the challenges related to asset integrity management, especially with FPSOs, is maybe not having some uh, reliable data or the historical data available to make uh, certain asset integrity management decisions. Um, can you talk a little bit about those challenges and maybe how uh, uh, Lloyd's Register can help overcome those? Yeah, uh, it's a major difficulty. If the information is not there originally, um, you have to go and try and get it. So you would go back to a, a theoretical point of view. What are we expecting to find? Uh, How is it predicted to degrade? And then we can identify, as I said, the, the hotspot locations. Where is the highest value information that we can get? Uh, and how can we use that information going forward? Uh, so that was that, That's how we would tackle it. So we identify what, what information would we want in front of us and then try and get a plan in place to, to get that information. Well, thank you. Um, so we have some questions coming in now. Um, one asks, uh, what further examples do you have in terms of organizations overcoming the challenges of conservatism through a project? OK, it's Neil here. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> really, it's... Um, a lot of life extensions we see, the, the examples I've given in the presentation has, has kind of combined many examples into one. Um, so really, uh, as an example, it, it, it is quite common to see um, platforms where weight hasn't been managed very well. Uh, and a life extension is often the trigger for the, the operator to go and look at the weight that's actually on the platform. And often, I think they can get quite big reductions in weight by doing that, but I, I guess the the overcoming the challenge of conservatism there is recognizing what conservatisms you've got, and then having the ability for the project team to think, well, 
We don't want to remove this at the moment, but we know we could remove that conservatism later if we find that we can't deal with it within the project. So it, the key one, one of the biggest ones is weight, I think, but also, um, for example, in structural analysis, um, the, the client may have given the instruction to use an omnidirectional load, so the load's the same in every direction. Um, perhaps not knowing the consequences that might cause much further down the line um, when you know piles are overutilized and structural members are overutilized and then somebody says oh well we could run with a, a directional load and that again is usually enough to take out quite a lot of um, conservatism in the answer so the, the, the presentation really combined many things into one but the, there are plenty of examples there okay um, our next question is, uh, how does Lloyd's Register technology qualification guidance differ from that of APIs? Okay, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which API guidance was being referred to, but it, it could be the subsea equipment qualification one. Um, but really, the, the Lloyd's Reg Register technology qualification is a very broad, um, very broadly written guidance and process that could almost be applied to anything that's new or innovative. Um, so it's a very broad process and not really sort of subsea or equipment specific. So that, that could be one difference. Okay, uh, this next question is uh, for Stuart. Uh, what would be your thoughts in merging the work management system and integrity management databases into one for a single entry, for single data entry? Uh, yeah, I'll probably just say that this wasn't a planted question, but um, I referred to uh, uh, Integrity Management System, which is Axum. Uh, basically, Lloyd's three, four, five years ago identified that this was the way forward, that the, the work management system and the Integrity Management database should be integrated and they should actually be together. So we've developed a, a new product, Axum, which actually sits within the work management system, such as Maximo, so it's integrated. It, it sits within it. There's no uh, middleware as such. It's, it's integrated fully. And now that gives you the ability to push your inspection plans into work orders, uh, close the loop with the repair orders back into your, your criticality assessments, your risk assessments, to fully learn and, and develop from that. Um, so yeah, it's it's possible, it's there, and it it's should be the way forward for the industry. It's, And we have another question from the audience. Um, are the same considerations of ALE for drilling uh, and production platforms? Sorry. Uh, I guess they're talking in, in terms of uh, weight for the design. Yeah, so it's Neil here. I think that's one for me. Um, I guess you uh, really, for an asset life extension, you, you really need to look at the specific platform. So I think it would, it might be different considerations. For example, a, a drilling platform may not have accommodation on it. So you really need to look at what's on it and what the consequences of failure are and how easy it is to demand. Uh, all those are considerations in life extension. Another question that we uh, we have from the audience is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the new technologies that are there to help overcome challenges mentioned, such as uh, new digital technologies and sensors to monitor structures? Uh, yeah, I guess that's for me again. Um, I think uh, I, I'm aware of some technologies, for example, to monitor scour on structures. Um, like real-time monitoring and also natural frequency monitoring. So those, those are sorts of things that we've seen included. But I think what you want to know is why you're putting those sensors on and are they going to give you the information that you need. Um, for instance, there's no point in having an inspection technology if you can't react to the results of that inspection in time to prevent a, a structural integrity issue. Um, and that's maybe, again, the sort of situation where you might want to employ a, a formal technology qualification process to make sure that you actually achieve what you want by including that new technology or new sensor on your platform. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, another question uh, that we have is uh, you spoke of uh, working within standards in your first presentation and identifying clear normative and informative standards. How do you address obsolete standards when you have to extend the life of an asset? The, the general principle um, that I see being followed is that the structure needs to meet today's um, standards. But often what you'll do is, is a gap analysis between today's standards and the, the original design standard, which was, is now obsolete, to see where the differences are and what you need to do within the analysis or, or how to, to sort of gain acceptance uh, and understand what the risks may be. All right, our next question is, in the event of an asset life extension, uh, in the event that an asset life extension is impossible due to ex excessive aging, uh, for example, some assets can be over 40 years old, uh, would you still recommend ALE or possible decommissioning? Um, if the results of the asset life extension says that there's going to be some major threat to uh, basically integrity or safety and, and life and obviously we'd recommend uh, shut down cessation of production and, and decommissioning unless of course there is some uh, remedial action that could be taken to, to help extend the life and then it becomes a decision as to whether that cost overweighs any, any benefit of continuing to operate. Okay, we have a, a, another question on um, conservativeness. Um, how, how is LR challenging conservativeness within existing industry standards? Um, it's Neil here, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, I mean, I, I sit on um, the technical panel for offshore geotechnics within the ISO standards, uh, and I also chair the offshore pile design um, technical panel on that that committee. So I think we are, uh, and I know I'm not alone in Lloyd's in parti um, participating in those, so we're, we're certainly involved with how ISO standards are written uh, and how they evolve, but obviously it, it, um, it can sometimes be a, a fairly slow process due to the number of people involved, or a, a number of opinions. So we, we of course um, want to make sure that the standards are still safe to use. So it's always a balance between getting conservatism out versus leaving something that's, that's safe to use. Uh, and that's certainly a, a balance that we, we help to strike. OK, um, I'm going to open it up to more questions from the audience. Uh, but I do wanted to, I wanted to ask Neil and Stuart if there are any other final thoughts that you guys may have on the, the presentation topic. I, I think um, you know the, the final thought for me is certainly that um, structural asset life extension or, or indeed uh, asset life extension in general is probably something that's best managed um, sooner rather than later. So if you leave it too late, it's probably going to get more difficult, um, maybe cost overruns or project overruns. So sooner, sooner rather than later is usually better. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, if there are any remaining questions, uh, I would direct you guys to either uh, reach out to myself, Audrey Leon, uh, with Offshore Engineer, or directly to Neil and Stuart. Uh, thank you for attending the presentation, and thank you both for your time. Thank you. Thank you.